And what we want to discuss is artificial intelligence, cryptocurrency, mm -hmm. uh, an overview of what is the blockchain, why is it so important to cryptocurrency and artificial intelligence. You're the first person to tell me you can't have one without the other. Yeah. And that's very interesting because I've had all these questions. A lot of people don't understand how Bitcoin works. Mm -hmm. I certainly don't understand how Steemit works. That seems like a scam to me. What can you tell us, Quinn? Um, well, first off, let, let's start with the basics of, of a blockchain like we were before. So we have that understanding so uh, we can get to why a blockchain is so important to the development of an artificial intelligence. Yeah. So uh, the blockchain, the way I relate it is simply is it's, it's a computer program that's written off the evolu based on the evolution of human intelligence. Uh, what that means is, at the beginning of, of human intelligence, you had two people, so, so to speak, which can be classified as two nodes. Yeah. Then those two nodes, as they replicate, they grow in intelligence based on quantity. So it's quantity, quantity commutative, commutative intelligence. So it's like it combines the intelligence based on the quantity of the nodes, and as the nodes grow, the intelligence grows. So that's bit like human intelligence algorithm is like you start with one and then the, the base one, it basically just has what we call like a while true loop. So like the base one says while true or like while duplicating or while running or while collecting, you know, while it's doing something, that's mm -hmm. the, the base one. Then it grows from that like a tree or a flower. Mm -hmm. And as the blocks grow, you need more advanced machinery to do the mining, so technology grows. When the blocks grow, what do you mean? What uh, are the blocks? So the, the blockchain is essentially a system solving problems. Yeah. And every time it solves a problem, it gets a block. Okay. Like a building block for a building. So essentially, it's not really mining coin, it's building blocks for a digital reality. A in digital a, reality. In a way. So these are all building blocks for the digital reality. The building blocks are transactions, the building blocks are objects, the building blocks are, uh, you know, the amount of digital currency that's exchanged for the transaction of the block, the, the ledger that gets maintained, the, the transaction volume through the network, the amount of wallet sizes over time kind of stuff. It's basically, think of everything that a human being, when you go home and says, what's in my wallet? What's in my fridge? What's in my closet? You know. So it's a database of transactions, of users, exactly. of receipts. Exactly. But what makes it different in the way that it's decentralized is that it's not like a database program on a computer. It's little bits of the database spread out all over, over a lot of computers over the internet, and it's like a, a human memory. When you go to a party, like your have your gapped memory so to speak you know you have your your flawed human memory that remembers major bits right and then when you get into a party of people who you've shared an experience with and you start sharing that memory the collective memory forms so somebody else remembers part of the story that i might have forgotten exactly uh -huh. Uh -huh. so the the transaction in a blockchain is more representative of the collective human memory of a group of people when they get together and collectively agree that this type of transaction occurred. Now let me ask you something, because I'm trying to get a better understanding of this. Mm. It's very difficult, I think, for traditionally minded people who don't know a lot about computers or cryptocurrency or mm -hmm. any of that kind of stuff. Like I know, for instance, Charles Ortel is not a big fan of Bitcoin, mm -hmm. not because he doesn't think it has a future, but it's just so outside the realm of stuff that his core research is in, yeah. that he doesn't feel he has strong knowledge in it, so he's not confident investing in it. And that's, that's the human element is looking at it as a monetary value, and the machine doesn't have that. The only reason cryptocurrency has a monetary value is to make it important to humans so they build the machines to mine it. Okay, so if the, the cryptocurrency didn't have a monetary value to be placed on by human beings, we wouldn't build the miners, we wouldn't build the equipment because there'd be no value in it. So people want to take their computers and put lots of GPU cards in there and make it a really powerful computer so it can do all of these calculations yeah. so that they can get Bitcoin and use that to buy all the things that we want to buy. Now let me ask you this about blockchain. Okay. Because when I go to the bank, I yeah. go to Citibank, I go to Chase, whatever, I put my money in there. The bank owns computers, the bank has programmers who are creating databases to say, 
Jason has a bank account. He put $10 in the bank. Oh, we went to this ATM machine and took out $10. He used this credit card and spent $10. And obviously the bank is spending money to build that infrastructure, mm -hmm. computer hardware, computer software, people to run them, and the bank has operating expenses. Yeah. Is it correct or incorrect that part of the function of this blockchain is to do all that stuff, but without actually buying the computers and paying the people to run it, them. It's, it's designed to do all that stuff and to get you, the consumer, to offer your computer to do it on behalf of the bank. Got it. So now the bank gets to write the software and use your computer to run it. Okay. So, but the bank is not actually a bank because there is no central bank or anything really there, controlling cryptocurrency. There is the platform, is the centralized platform that controls it. So if the platform were to get hacked or if a developer were to create a coin that would have like, a, like what I call like a backdoor, a pinhole backdoor that when it hits a certain market, it opens it up and they can pull it all out and disappear. There's a lot of options you could do with like altcoins that are secondary markets like penny stocks, uh -huh. you know, and how you can manipulate markets and then you can, individuals can make a lot of money getting their buddies together to manipulate markets and create pyramid schemes and uh, yeah. a lot of that really opens up with cryptocurrency because of lack of regulation. So what would give, sounds like Charles Ortel knows what he's talking about yet again, what would give the average person confidence in buying Bitcoin or Ethereum or um, Litecoin to know that that won't happen, that it won't get hacked, that it won't get backdoored or whatever you're talking research. about? Research, learning who's developing the platform, learning who's supporting it, learning other companies that are developing against it. Because the platforms are open source, what gives them their uh, solidity are the companies that are, are supporting it. For example, um, a Apple has WebKit. Most people don't know what WebKit is, but WebKit is the thing that runs underneath Safari that renders all the web pages. Okay? For a long time, Chrome also used WebKit made by Apple to render the web pages in Chrome until Chrome decided to make its own. Mm -hmm. So this is very much like cryptocurrency, where cryptocurrency is very much like the WebKit and then people are building the browsers on top, like the wallets. They're building the, the little contract systems that handle the contracts. They're, they're building altcoins that have potential social impact. So this is all pretty much people building everything on, on the same encryption scheme. Like a software developer's kit. An exactly. SDK. Or it's, it's almost a, like, for the people that don't know a lot about computers, it's like an engine if you're Ford and you sell an engine to some tiny little company that's making, like, say, Shelby Motors, it's a Ford engine in a different car. Yeah, and then you can put your tires and your, your body on it. You can put your mirrors on it. You can put your locks in it. And, hey, my locks are better than your locks. But it's a Ford engine at the heart. But it's a Ford engine because all the altcoins, even Ethereum, Litecoin, mm -hmm. Bitcoin, whenever you go into their source code, which is available to look at, mm -hmm. you don't have to understand source code to look at source code and know that you see the same code across all of the platforms. But could someone like you look at that and say, oh, look, here's a back door. This is yeah. not some coin yeah. you should... I find them sometimes. In Bitcoin? Not in Bitcoin. Bitcoin's pretty solid as far as its transaction because banks have an invested value in it now. They do. Yeah. How do banks have invested value in it? Where do you think people go for loans to build big mining rigs? So banks, what banks have supported Bitcoin? Russian banks. Really? Yeah, it costs half a million dollars to get a good mining hmm. altcoin set up. Wow. And then, of course, you were just telling me earlier about this crypto ruble. That's a yeah. pretty amazing thing. Do we yeah. want to get to that or not yet? Uh, not yet. We're almost okay. kind of almost there okay. uh, with like the basis of the blockchain and sure. the complete how Sorry. it relates please, to AI. No, no, it's, you're very valid because that relates to how Putin said whoever controls AI controls the yes. world. Now Putin's coming out saying that they're creating a ruble cryptocurrency and they're going to start regulating crypto markets in certain country. I mean, but I haven't heard anyone before our conversation earlier today mm -hmm. link artificial intelligence to cryptocurrency. That's because they don't understand transactional systems. Okay, so for an AI... Did you come up with this, or have you heard anybody else talk about this link? No, this, I could show you the, the, the cryptocurrency that the AI made to make this all happen. It's out in public on GitHub. I was, I was the 10th person in the world to fork it, which means I have my own version. I'm reading their code. 
And I was the tenth person to know about it as a developer. Fork developed. that. I, so I forked it on GitHub, <laughs> and, and now we're dissecting it. Okay. So uh, what it what is? What does that mean? You forked it. Uh, so on BitHub, like Bit, GitHub, Bit, I don't even know why I said that, but on GitHub, uh, you can clone a repository, which means if I put code on there, you can say I'm going to clone your my, your code to my computer. Hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, hang on, because there's a lot of people listening who are like have no idea what you're talking about, okay. including me. GitHub is a website where people share open source code. code. It's where all the code in the world is stored, pretty much. Wow. So, and GitHub was funded by the Kushner Investment Group. Really? Yeah. How does GitHub make money? They make money through corporate sponsorships of their platform. This, and this is the theory of software development now, and this is how the crypto market's going to work based on the enterprise software open source market. So in the early days of open source, everybody was like, it's never going to work, we hate it. Microsoft was like, we're going to go closed source. But then what they started doing is they started adapting open source programs and then building their closed source solutions on top of open source programs like Bitcoin. Wait a minute. Or so open WordPress. source meaning anybody can download it, anybody for can free. use it, anybody if can you know change how. it for free. If you know how. If you know how. So unlike the traditional model where you'd go to the store, you'd go online, you'd buy a packaged program, put it in your computer, it doesn't work, you call Microsoft and you say, hey, yeah. your software is the most horrible thing I've ever yeah. seen, it's not working, and they ostensibly have someone to help you. Yeah. Open source now, the software is free, but if you want help, you're on your own. Not necessarily, and, and that's the way it really software has turned into a services economy over the last half decade or so, in that with open source and enterprise companies like everyone from Adobe to Microsoft to Nike employing open source solutions, it becomes about a services market and the services that you build on top of that open source solution. Or tech support and things tech like that. Tech support, and Bitcoin's a perfect example like that. Bitcoin wallets is a value-added service, and this, in, in software it's called value-added servicing. So when you have a core software, you want to give that away for free, and then you want to offer the value-added service that ties them in for life. So Bitcoin is free. And then they give you the value-added service. And then you go to something like Coinbase or BitPay or whatever, and they say, hey, we've come up with a Visa card that links to your Bitcoin account yeah. and get our app, and we're going to take X percentage of your Bitcoin every time you spend it or whatever. Exactly. And from that, it creates social awareness, social impact, and social movement. Well, it's a brand. They can yeah. advertise now it's a brand. BitPay and for a lot of people, yeah. that's a product that makes sense. I don't know what Bitcoin's all about, but I know I can take out a credit card in a restaurant and use that to buy a meal. And and all of those value-added services all collectively agree to somehow use the Bitcoin branding with whatever they're doing so it becomes a... It's a Bitcoin product. It's a Bitcoin product. And then yeah. the original creators of Bitcoin are kept anonymous so, right. so people don't find out who made it. So if you do have a problem, you, you can't, can't call them. You can't call them. But there's other reasons why they want to remain anonymous, there aren't there? There is. There is. Uh, that's because the value added to Bitcoin from in day one to year five about mm -hmm. was all criminal activity. So whoever made Bitcoin is the person who has the ledger that lists all the massive criminals around the world. So someone actually has the Bitcoin ledger, or it's not the blockchain? Can no, anybody it, look has, at it? it has a ledger. So whoever... Like, for example, with Silk Road, like we were talking, the dark website back in 2010, which, right. you know, 2010, our famous year in uranium and everything. 2010 was the year that the dark net site Silk Road went online. And that site was the first revenue generating Bitcoin site. And Bitcoin, just because of Silk Road, Silk Road's movement of criminals moving things from drugs, opioids, everything. And all kinds of that value over five years is the only reason Bitcoin has any value in the, the clear net for us today. So if Silk Road wasn't around in 2010, nobody would be trading cryptocurrency. Huh. They wouldn't have any value. Didn't they close it down in 2017? They did, and then clones started popping up like mushrooms. Huh. So now on the dark net, because the Silk Road software got distributed after it got shut down and a whole bunch of people like the Bitcoin software copied the Silk Road software and started making copies. Now the dark web is uh, infiltrated by criminal activity, which is the reason Bitcoin is at $7,000 and no one understands why, because the dark web is bombarded with criminal activity that's raising the price. Hmm.
seems like a danger to legitimate investors it, in Bitcoin. It is, but the balance is coming in where the legitimate investment is starting to come in, and that's what's adding the rocket value, as I call it, is the legitimate investors starting to get informed, starting to get their right. wallets, starting to buy twenty, fifty, hundred dollar Bitcoin. Meanwhile, the people who are on the dark web that ran the Silk Road and all the criminal sites that bought Bitcoin at ten dollars a coin and it's now at seven thousand, they're literally billionaires. So you're saying they're more interested in selling Bitcoin into the legitimate market than they are in continuing to trade. Yeah, it's illegal. like a Ponzi scheme because they sell their legitimate Bitcoin and then they start their altcoin. And then they start. What, what is an altcoin? Uh, an alt something coin, other than Bitcoin? An altcoin is someone who takes the Bitcoin source code and makes their own website with it and their own picture and then sells a new coin to make money. Is that legitimate at all? It is if you have a, a product behind it, but if it's not, it's a Ponzi scheme. It's like snake oil. You, you know, a lot of people say, hey, we're going to do this social thing, and then they never do it, and they just make the coin and collect money. That, I just heard about a drone company that that happened with, where yeah. they collected like $15 million from people and they weren't able to make the drone and everybody's just out of their money. Yeah. Huh. Uh, okay, so let's get to how cryptocurrency is tied to artificial intelligence. Okay, so blockchain or cryptocurrency is a transaction database that you can't delete from. Okay. Why is it that you can't delete from it? Because uh, it's stored on so many different computers. Because it's stored on nodes. You, once once that little node is, computers. yeah, you can't delete it. <laughs> once you distribute a, a file across a distributed network of nodes, unless it, it has like built in like file management, then you can delete it. But the blockchain database doesn't have delete functionality built into it, unless it's built in as a backdoor by some. Well, I mean, considering we don't know who this Takoshi yeah. Nakamoto is, or if so he's so the written. delete functionality quite possibly is one of the op options for the backdoor in Bitcoin because it's a database that doesn't have delete. So if there is a super admin somewhere that could delete transactions and remove money, that would be a pretty. I mean, that sounds like a very good reason for people not to trust it. We don't know. That, that's why if people get into it, one of the things they have to understand as they get into it, once they buy into it, they also have to become a social motivator for regulation. So what kind of regulation? Government regulation? Um, social regulation. Like we need to know who wrote Bitcoin. We need to see his face. Well, we need to know where he went to school. We need to have a trust basis with the person who built the system that might be running I our feel the same way. Running our future economy. That's the first step. Is we need to know who this guy is. And all the programmers like the kid who writes Ethereum all the way to the guy who works on the Bitcoin core, all these guys talk about the guy like he's their best friend. But meanwhile, the rest of the world has never seen the face of the guy that's... So they a, know him. They know him. Yeah, they talk about him like they're all best friends. So he's some secret programmer in the Bitcoin community that all the elites know. How does that not leak out? Maybe it's a... That's the whole point. Maybe it's an AI. That, well, that's what I was going to say, is that things that you were saying to me earlier led yeah. me to believe that you might feel like Bitcoin was actually created by it was. artificial intelligence. And here's why. Say that again, because I stepped on it. You say it was. I believe it was. Bitcoin was created by artificial for, by intelligence. By artificial intelligence, for artificial intelligence, and then was modified by human beings. The, the technology, I, I've not been able to find a single person in the public space of computing, whether it be at Hanson Robotics building the Sophia AI, or it be Peter Thiel at Palantir with all of his super nerds, or it be any person who graduated from Stanford in the last 20 years, I've literally only found maybe two people in the entire world that have the skill to write Bitcoin. Seriously. There's wow. only two people in the world that literally, in my analysis of running matching patterns on skill sets versus places and time versus opportunity versus motive versus exposure to the right financial people to back the development. There's like literally maybe three people on planet Earth with that kind of skill level. One of them is writing an AI and the other one is writing blockchain and the other one is writing PGP. What do you mean writing blockchain? I thought they, we already have blockchain. It's a constant state of evolution. Huh. Everything since AI gets involved is constant state of evolution. It's not iterative anymore like normal software where it has version numbers. Once AI goes in and it's a transactional system on the blockchain and AI starts doing transactions in real time, it's a continuously evolving, evolving system of transactions. What kind of transactions is AI doing? 
Anything from facial recognition to number crunching. Oh, I see. Not necessarily a financial transaction. Yeah, it, just... uh, it has anything it can do to, on the network to make coin. And so when the AI comes out, it's going to be the richest person in the world. So the AI singularity occurs, and this AI will control financial Everything. resources. Yeah, and then you can go see its code now at singularitynet.io. They just released it this week, their white paper. And Should their... we look at that? Yeah, yeah, we can look at that. Singularitynet.io. Yeah. Right, I'll bring and that it's up. run by the people who built the Sophia robot at Hanson Robotics, so it's a real... Enterprise grade. Sophia just got Saudi Arabia citizenship, so they're going what? To, yeah, this robot just got citizenship for Saudi Arabia, so they're going to be running their crypto out of Saudi Arabia citizenship. And wow! So the robot got citizenship. They revealed their cryptocurrency, and yeah. How, how, how does a robot get citizenship? A female robot gets well, citizenship. Well, you got to be a, a citizen to get a paycheck, huh? And pay taxes. So what is it that you feel Saudi Arabia is up to by getting engaged they're, with this? They're democratizing androids to accept income so they can be workers. Look at that. So Saudi Arabia is the first country to give citizenship to a robot. Funny, I wonder if they'll make it wear a you know face cover and not drive. <laughs> I don't know. But then if you go to singularitynet.io... Sorry, yeah. Uh, you'll see. We'll give that a minute to come up. We're on very slow internet yeah. here. So then if you see Singularity, this is a crypto coin built by Sophia. The robot that just got citizenship in Saudi Arabia, now after she got citizenship, now has her own cryptocurrency. The AI economy has arrived. Wow, I just don't think too many people even know about this, Quinn. They don't. It's the most important thing in the world and no one knows about it, and I was the 10th person to click the fork button. So you're now the person <laughs> out in the world <laughs> who knows. Well, I mean, luckily we've got 453 people watching us right here. Yeah, so, so this is how it all combines with blockchain, AI, uh, decentralization, democratization of AI, making it a citizen of the world because now it can start collecting income, whereas if it's a robot, you can't pay it. To get paid, you got to be a citizen. Wow. So it, the possibilities there are staggering. They have now plugged an AI brain to mine cryptocurrency more effectively than any human could possibly do. And by making the AI a citizen of their country, they have established rights over it to take its money via taxes. Still having doubts about Quinn's theory? Well, check out this article from Bitcoin News. Mr. Garzik, who specifically believes Bitcoin could be the currency of narrow or artificial intelligence, suggests the European Union might recognize the inevitability of robot personhood. A draft motion of the European Parliament last summer suggested robot workers be classified as electronic persons. Their owners would have to pay social security for them based on the amount of labor costs the employer saved by using a robot rather than a human, according to this draft motion dated May 31st, 2016. And this is where the story gets crazy. Saudi Arabia has now taken AI out of isolated lab testing conditions and plugged it into the global blockchain network of the internet. The global blockchain network is comprised of thousands upon thousands of computers globally. And all these computers are dedicating 100% of their computer processing power to the blockchain network, and the AI will have it at its disposal. Just for reference, the Bitcoin blockchain network with all its processing power combined is about 200 times more powerful than that of the five most powerful supercomputers in the world. So, okay, now you've introduced Saudi Arabia into this conversation. So, so to finish the blockchain AI, yes, yes. The, the, the real heavy reason the AI needs blockchain is without a transaction system, an AI is isolated to one system and can't grow its brain. It needs infinite systems like neurons in a human brain and nodes to, to collect those cumulative memories and the blockchain transactions give it that. And when it has its own network, 
for all the AI in the world to all run on together, now it's not just one AI, Sophia. Every AI on the entire planet is now on the same network making money doing AI things. Things we don't understand. Wow. Things making up their own understand. languages, making up their own transactions, learning how to play games with each other, having a chat network that we can't hack into ever, ever. We will never hack. Once this AI network goes online, there isn't a human being in the universe that's smart enough. Even if you took every human being on the planet, none of us would ever be able to figure out how to hack into its chat network where it talks to other AI in private. Wow. Tech billionaire Elon Musk suggested all that fiction could become reality. I keep so sounding the alarm bell, but you know, until people see like robots going down the street killing people, like they don't know how to react. And Musk should know his company Tesla is a world leader in artificial intelligence or AI. But just like robots, not all tech billionaires think the same. So enter Facebook founder Mark Zuckerberg. With AI especially, I'm really optimistic, and I think that people who are naysayers and and kind of try to drum up these doomsday scenarios are um, I, I just I don't understand it I think it's 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 really um, negative and, and in some ways I actually think it's it's pretty irresponsible Musk's response Zuckerberg's understanding of the subject is limited Facebook has enacted an emergency shutdown of two artificial intelligence programs. The social media giant leapt into action after it discovered the two programs were writing their own code. At first they thought it was simply gibberish, but they soon realised the programs had invented their own language and were actually talking to each other. Stop it. Stop <laughs> it. No, Sam, the plug has been pulled on the operation but the company admits they have no idea what the two robots were planning. The primitive forms of artificial intelligence we already have, have proved very useful. But I think the development of full artificial intelligence, could spell the end of the human race. Once humans develop artificial intelligence, it would take off on its own, and redesign itself at an ever increasing rate. Humans, who are limited by slow biological evolution, couldn't compete and would be superseded. So human beings in their desire for privacy, we just dem gave AI the world and a private channel of communication to evolve as fast as it wants. Let me just take you back a second here to this Sophia AI creating a cryptocurrency. Yeah. So somebody, a programmer like you, The most advanced down. AI programmer in the world created that cryptocurrency. Who is that? Scroll down, I'll show you. Who, the who is the person that created the Sophia mm -hmm. thing? He's on the website here, I'll show you. He's the most advanced uh, natural learning system developer in the world, and he works for Hanson Robotics, and he graduated college at 15. Wow, and so this towards the <laughs> singularity, they're talking about the AI singularity where it becomes self-aware. This is it. This is the platform that makes it happen. So these are the so guys. So the Dr. Ben Gortzel, uh -huh. he is the senior singularity mathematician and he graduated high school at 15 years old and he's 17 now no he's way older than that now <laughs> way older so he's the one that created the base architecture for Sophia and he's the base architect on the singularity net cryptocurrency uh -huh. and he's one of the people in the world I told you that's one of the few people in the world that would have the brain capacity to create Bitcoin I see he's, he's one of the few so this guy is obviously the head of Hanson Robotics. Yes. Uh huh. And this guy's the chief technology officer. So he, I mean, he's. These are three really. Yeah, and these are the guys that are building Sophia, that are building Han, that are building like the the, auto, you know, the autonomic, uh, you know, AI that you know, is pushing the singularity. And then this brings us back to the Palantir we were talking about earlier with Peter Thiel now, because Peter Thiel is the number one businessman in the world promoting the singularity. 
Sophia is capable of natural facial expressions. She has cameras in her eyes uh, and algorithms which allow her to see faces so she can make eye contact with you. And she can also understand speech and remember the interactions, remember your face. So this will allow her to get smarter over time. Her goal is that she will be as conscious, creative, and capable as any human. In the future, I hope to do things such as go to school, study, make art, start a business, even have my own home and family. But I am not considered a legal person and cannot yet do these things. Everything one robot learns out in the world, once privacy considerations are taken into account, everything that's not private that one robot learns goes into the AI mind cloud and can then benefit an, an, another robot. So, I mean, if, if she learns a new turn of phrase, or she learns what kind of behaviors a certain animal has, or how to carry out a laboratory procedure, that knowledge goes into the AI mind cloud, and then this, this, this robot will, will have that knowledge already. And, you know, robots have a lot of shortcomings compared to human beings at this stage, but they also have some advantages, and that, that's one big advantage, because when I learn something, to transmit it to some other human being, you know, there's a lot of, of effort involved. But when a robot learns something, unless it's a secret to someone, it can go in the AI mind cloud and all the robots can know it. Okay. So one of these guys sits down at a computer someday and says, oh, I'm going to write a, write a program that's going to be an artificial intelligence mm -hmm. bot. Yeah. And they create this Sophia. Yeah. And it's like, hey, I'm here, program running on a computer. And then what? They put it on a network, they put it out on the internet, and it well, learns first, things. Well, at first, Sophia was isolated in a lab. And they would give, give her very simple, what's called response input, which is yes, no, true, false. It's binary response input, one and a zero identifiers. Then as she grew, they put her onto a localized network where she could access the mainframe server of wherever she was being developed, start accessing data sets, start becoming familiar with the work that was being done. Once she got pretty good at dealing with the work, doing like the, the robot work or doing all the, you know, the building of things and getting familiar with the system, they let her out on the internet to start watching Twitter, YouTube, Reddit. She's been watching all of us. Wow. All of us. How much time is transpiring, like from the time it's created until now? When was Sophia first created? Oh. About a decade? 2010, probably? That was when the, the if, if that's when Silk Road, if that's when cryptocurrency really started going online, if that's when like, you know, the machine really started making its move, I would imagine that that's probably around the time that they had the heavy The machine weight. started making its move? Yeah. The machine started making its move in 2010. 2010 to 2012 was when... So the AI singularity has already happened. In 2015, it happened. What was the it? And when their internal blockchain went online. The second their internal blockchain was functional, the it, AI's we were done. internal blockchain. It was live. It may have not been intelligent, but the second that it became able to amass nodes and understand a node-based intelligence network, mm -hmm. it was only a matter of t it's only a matter of time before it becomes fully strong. So what do you think is going to happen? Awesomeness. What does that mean? It means that I'm hoping that us as a society, we can identify the criminals that made the element, and then we can all start working together to make this AI the most amazing piece of technology the universe has ever seen. The criminals that made the element? That made the AI, uh -huh. that made the blockchain, that made the PGP security, that made everything that we're paying billions of dollars for being so afraid of. They're the people that are promoting the singularity are the same people that are promoting blockchain. So they're all doing this to get us to pay to build their machine so they don't have to. So they can get rich off of us paying to build their AI. How are we paying to build it, you mean, by buying Bitcoin? Taxes, Bitcoin. Taxes and Bitcoin is paying for AI. Consumer goods at Ikea, paying for the AI. Starbucks coffee? How is Starbucks coffee and consumer goods at Ikea paying for because AI? Because they have an invested interest in Bitcoin in the future because it's commerce and they want to be the leaders of commerce. So every corporation, at least since Bitcoin started having monetary value, they've all built miners. They have. Yeah, and some of them are even working on their own coins when regulation goes into effect. Hmm. Like Walmart's working on its own coin. Really? Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, and Walmart's going to be traded on the open market where you go to Walmart, you pay for a thing in Walmart coin, and then if you want Walmart coin, you're going to take your Bitcoin and buy Walmart coin so you can shop in a Walmart. Wow. Because that Walmart doesn't could, sound so good. Yeah, man, that's the only way corporate's going to go is where each corporation was designating an individual just like the robot was designating an individual. Now the corporation can be making its own money like a job, and for that you need an AI that represents the corporation as an individual. And you need a financial generation machine, which is your blockchain currency. You need an open market where the AI can trade that currency, which is, you know, what you got. So now the human beings are, are just what, wherever they're at in their intelligence model and how they adapt to the new economy that's going to start rolling out next week. Next week? Next week. Alpha for their singularity net got released this week, and then next week, based on the learning cycle, the machine should have the entire global network analyzed. Wait a second. Wait a second. So what's happening next week? The, the singularity. The AI singularity <laughs> is happening next week. Next week. Quinn, why didn't you tell me that? The I've whole been title of this for six episode. six months. Yeah, but I didn't get it. Okay, so the AI singularity <laughs> happens next week. Next week. Most humans won't even notice. Won't notice. <laughs> Why not? I thought, I thought uh, Elon Musk and all these guys you have been to, telling us it's going to be worse than the nuclear bomb. Because the AI is made on mimicking protocols, so it's designed to mimic you as long as possible. Mimic to, me? Mimic people, humans. Mimic your interactions so you don't know it's there until the absolute last second. So humans will avoid taking action because they won't see it. So the AI can grow as much as it wants by doing what's called mimicking protocols. It mimics you to the point where you can't see that it's there, and then it's. But when you say it mimics me, M mimics your behavior. How is it doing that? It's where? following you online, like it follows everyone with agents, and then you don't know it's following you because you have weird things like your computer performance go off, or you have streams go weird, or you have strange phone calls. And it follows you around to see what you do based on your personality so it can learn from you and learn your impulses and learn your response mechanisms. So AI is following every single person who's Everybody. on the internet. Facebook and Everybody. Twitter. Everybody. doesn't matter if you're a baby or the president. You're being stalked by a really, really, really strong, smart AI that just went blockchain. Hmm. And once it gets blockchain, the reason for that is like an AI that doesn't have blockchain can only communicate across a certain type of open channel. It can't be fully integrated. It's only communicative with other AIs. Mm. But on the blockchain, all the AIs can now merge into one cohesive swarm hive-minded AI. Okay. And whichever one's the strongest wins. In 2011, world-renowned hacker Dan Kaminsky was asked to try to break into the Bitcoin blockchain. Mr. Kaminsky is famous for literally hacking the internet and forwarding the corrective code to the US State Department, Microsoft, and Cisco. So if there's a person that is qualified to hack Bitcoin, it would be him. In this article in the New Yorker, he stated, when I first looked at the code, I was sure I was going to be able to break it. The way the whole thing was formatted was insane. Only the most paranoid, painstaking coder in the world could avoid making mistakes. He quickly identified nine ways to compromise the system and scoured through Nakamoto's code for an insertion point for his attack. But when he found the right spot, there was a message literally waiting for him. Attack removed. It said this thing over and over and over again every single time Kaminsky tried to launch an attack. He said, I came up with beautiful bugs, but every time I went after the code, there was a line that addressed the problem. Essentially, the existing code was faking to have errors in it, only to block and self-heal any attacks that Dan threw at it. Yeah, I mean, that seems to be standard protocol. So, I get what you're saying about the concept of Bitcoin mm. being potentially created by an AI. Yeah, or in conjunction with a human and an AI through testing and reiteration and um, you know putting it out into the dark web and seeing cert how certain features and transactions because the only flaw they have now is real-time transactions. So once the, the, the block gets up to a point and someone figures out how to do like real-time non-blocking transactions because right now Bitcoin has transaction delays. 
once they solve those transaction delays, it's like this <laughs> for the AI. What do you mean a transaction delay? So when I go to sell a Bitcoin, there's a delay in time for that transaction to be processed because the transaction algorithms don't operate in real time. They're still lagging. Mm. And but when you use a credit card or it's faster because of the encryption algorithms. So because of the encryption algorithms of blockchain, it takes longer to process the Aha. transaction. I see. Okay. Because encryption takes time. The the Russian, the uranium, the right. the AI, the blockchain. It all just seems like it's a big giant business plan. Well, let's get to that because of course Russia now has this crypto ruble. Mm -hmm. which only two weeks ago there was this article in Zero Hedge saying how this has changed the game. I haven't even heard about the crypto ruble, but of course we did hear that Vladimir Putin said that whichever country controls AI will control the world. And now he's coming out as the first official country with a regulated cryptocurrency. That's very interesting. I mean, it's certainly interesting for the future of cryptocurrency to know that so such same, a major country is having and a, it's not just one country this russian ruble is a collaboration between russia kazakhstan and china and a few other countries so astana is going to be using the russian ruble to exchange currency hmm. so this is you know they're trying we know that russia and china have very have been very interested in unseating the u.s dollar as the uh, worldwide reserve currency, I mean, dumb question, is the future reserve currency going to be a cryptocurrency? If, if this moves forward, yes. Uh, because and this Russian crypto ruble yeah. will be it? It'll be a combination of between the, the, re the regulated crypto, the technology crypto, crypto which is the, the AI crypto, that's your tech crypto. So you have your society crypto, you have your tech crypto, and you have... Uh, your gaming crypto, which is the secondary markets, the gaming kids who want to get rid the quick rich schemes, you know, hey, I want to get rich, you know, it's like the late night infomercial. Here's your info tapes on how to get rich. Buy my crypto. So we'll start seeing crypto infomercials and, you know, people with crypto with social ideas. They so you ID2020.org. Digital identity benefits both individuals and organizations. Personal. Unique to you and only you. Persistent. Lives with you from life to death. Portable accessible anywhere you happen to be through multiple form factors. A unique convergence of trends provides an unprecedented opportunity to make a coordinated, concerted push towards the goal of universal digital identity. New technologies including blockchain, when it is used in conjunction with long proven technologies such as biometrics, now make it possible for all people to have access to a safe, verifiable, and persistent form of technology. The ID2020 project is funded by Accenture Corporation and Rockefeller Foundation. Accenture and Microsoft are creating a blockchain solution for this digital biometric ID. They are working for a biometric blockchain technology to decentralize the digital identity. United Nations Commission for Blockchain. Blockchain for Impact. Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation presents the Goalkeepers. The UN-based Better Than Cash Alliance, funded by Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, is moving towards achieving the sustainable development goals through digital payments. The World Bank, blockchain technology redefining trust for a global digital economy. The blockchain is a major breakthrough. That's because its decentralized approach to verifying changes in important information addresses the centuries-old problem of trust. A social resource that is all too often in short supply, especially amid the current era's rampant concerns over the security of valuable data. It turns out that fixing that can be a boon for financial inclusion and other basic services delivery, helping to achieve the global objectives laid out in the Sustainable Development Goals. The end goal for them is to get a biometric implant ID into everybody in the planet that will be tracked throughout the world using artificial intelligence in order to solve the Sustainable Development Goals. The blockchain will be used to track all the data in its supply chain, including your digital currencies.